name is Blake Norton. I'm the curator for the Cultural Heritage Center. Uh, based upon the positive reviews from the paper I presented last year over Suganak at the 2020 Family Reunion Festival, I thought I would share another paper over a pretty pivotal individual in the tribe's history named Wabunzi. It was a cool dark night and seated around a small fire was a Potawatomi raiding party of tribal leaders and some of history's most notable warriors. Discussing the long trip they had made from Illinois and expressing disappointment that they had no trophies to return home were Padragoshuk and Shebne. Black Partridge, the leader of the party, sternly focused on the fire. Unable to contain his anger, Wabunzi, the younger brother of Black Partridge, leapt to his feet and questioned the group. Am I the only brave man here? Tonight, I will enter the fort and I will get a scalp. The fort in question was Fort Osage. With land secured in the 1808 Treaty of Fort Clark and built under the direction of William Clark of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, Fort Osage was constructed to exercise control over the newly acquired Louisiana Territory as both a far western trading center and military garrison. It also served to strengthen commercial relationships with local Osage traders and protect them from warring tribes. This evening, they would need protection from the blood-feuding Potawatomi, who had traveled over 400 miles on horseback to collect Osage prizes. Despite historical disputes over territory and resources that were primarily fueled by close proximity of Osage and Potawatomi villages in neighboring Illinois and Missouri, the formal feud began in the 1750s. At this time, the Potawatomi were in a war of extermination with the Illinois. As Illinois numbers began to dwindle, the Osage gave aid to the defeated people, officially sealing their fate as formal enemies of the Potawatomi. These tensions were exploited by Spanish officials in the 1790s as Potawatomi mercenaries were contracted to rid the Louisiana territory of Osage raiders. Camped a short distance away, the raiding party could easily see Fort Osage perched above the Missouri River. Singing and the sound of the enemy's drum could be heard from behind the palisade, infuriating Wabunzi and his trailing comrades. It was a dark night with very little moonlight, so the Potawatomi were able to scale the fort's wooded embankment without being seen by sentries. After some time and with considerable difficulty, a small porthole was discovered in the palisade. The invitation our warrior was wanting. Barely able to fit through the opening, Wabunzi left his carbine and entered the fort with only his neck knife and tomahawk. In an effort to remain unseen, he entered the closest building. Looking around and seeing cooking utensils, he quickly realized that he was in the fort's mess hall. Lighting the torch, Wabunzi saw a scene both troubling and enticing. The mess hall was littered with sleeping Osage warriors. Weighing his options, Wabunzi considered abducting a young boy to make him his son, but thought this would cause too much noise and prevent him from escaping. Stealthily creeping between the sleeping enemy, Wabunzi saw his prize. He knew immediately that the Osage, noticeably larger than any other, was the monster Osage that he had heard stories of. It was said that the monster had large growths on his head that resembled the horns of a buffalo and the temperament to match. Wabunzi brandished the tomahawk from his belt and moved on his prize. The first swing missed its mark, waking the monster. Swinging again, the Osage deflected the blow with his buffalo robe. As the fight continued, the monster Osage would bellow every time Wabunzi made a successful strike. With what sounded like an injured buffalo, the hall of warriors awoke and saw their leader bloody and nearly defeated. All charged Wabunzi, pushing him and brandishing knives. In the chaos, Wabunzi successfully took a scout from an Osage who was thrown to the floor and then quickly made for the escape. Recounting the story later in life, Wabunzi noted his enemies were grabbing his feet as he squeezed through the porthole. Wabunzi, born Noxace, was a powerful and influential headman among the Potawatomi, Odawa, and Ojibwe villages of the Illinois and Indiana. Most accounts indicate that Wabunzi was born in the mid to late 18th century in Terracoupe, Indiana. He was afforded a traditional upbringing before foreign settlement and influence permanently changed tribal life. 
He endured the customary rites of passage for Potawatomi men, becoming a skilled hunter and warrior at an early age. His father Wabshkam and older brother Black Partridge were also famous warriors, motivating him to take the same path. He was extremely ambitious and opportunistic, characteristics that helped seal his future legacy. Tribal histories tell us that Wabunzi was a high-ranking priest in the ancient Medewan Medicine Society, a fact easily distinguished by the facial paint he commonly wore. Each successive degree or rank of a priest is attributed with special knowledge and training of medicines, healing practices, and the ability to confer with spirits. These metaphysical powers no doubt assisted Wabunzi in leading warriors into battle, as well as elevating his esteem among not only the Potawatomi, but all neighboring tribes. During an 1845 trip to Washington, D.C., Wabunzi recounted how he earned his name. Avenging a wound that he received while attacking a provision boat on Indiana's White River, Noxace, as he was then known, and a small group of warriors began raiding small settlements, seeking retribution. One evening, while the group was stealing horses, Noxus was confronted by the owner. Seizing the man and killing him before he could make a noise, Noxus proclaimed to his warriors, the people will now know me and always call me Wabunzi, signifying the dawn of day or causer of paleness. When I kill an enemy, he turns pale, resembling the first light of the day. Openly opposed to American expansion, yet understanding the need to delegate for peace and the survival of his people, the name Wabunzi can be found among the treaties penned between the United States and Potawatomi Nation. Resulting from the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, Wabunzi steered removal negotiations for the United Band of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, and led the villages of Illinois and Wisconsin to a new reservation in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Wabunzi understood that there had to be amicable relations with the federal government, but also wanted the U.S. to stand by its terms. Party to numerous compacts, Wabunzi wanted to represent his nation not only as a delegate, but as a leader who would hold all parties accountable. Tribal historian and leader Joseph Napoleon Bursaw confirmed this by saying, these qualities made him a first-rate diplomat in treaty making. There were never sufficient barriers in his way to thwart him from executing the projects he might have in view. In the late fall of 1836, Wabunzi met with President Andrew Jackson. Despite of lack of government support and several attempts to delay the meeting due to weather, the Potawatomi leader refused to wait for a more opportune time. Wabunzi stated that he did not belong to the president and should not be restricted to meet with him as he considered them to be equals. He had an urgent message for President Jackson, and that is why he ignored invitations to meet him in the summer. Despite this small statement, the message had tremendous impact. It illustrated that Wabunzi understood how important he was to his nation. In the winter of 1845, Wabunzi visited Washington, D.C. for the second time. Circumstances of this trip were similar to the last. The U.S. government desired all of the removed Potawatomi to consolidate on one reservation in northern Kansas. This would provide the opportunity to effectively and efficiently render all delayed annuities and services that were promised in the removal treaties of the 1830s to the Potawatomi. The meetings fostered a successful treaty that was signed and ratified on July 22, 1846, creating what would become known as the Kansas River Reserve. Records indicate that Wabunzi was around 80 to 90 years old when he made the winter trip and complained often about the painful wounds that he had received early in life that were now debilitating. Eager to get home and relax, Wabunzi ignored the pleas to avoid hostile weather and stay in Washington, D.C. until spring. This was a fatal decision as the stagecoach he was riding in crashed. Suffering from serious injuries and fever, Wabunzi died. Learning of his death, Joseph Bursall wrote, his death was a shock to the whole nation. It had seemed as though he never was to die by his calculations and the sayings of the people. He held a high rank and character in our nation, was much esteemed for his wisdom as a counselor and was highly respected and much feared. 
He was the strongest man in our national councils and was a serpent in Indian diplomacy and national affairs in general, and a master judge of human nature.